All right, 1983, making the Kingsman name, state champs. All right, we, we saw this picture building when this group was a sophomore group. Now, in hindsight, they, they run the table, win the state championship, beat uh, revenge a loss to the Bricks here at home, and then you beat Indianapolis Washington for the state championship. Uh, let's just talk about the attitude by the coaching staff, Chris, prior to the 1983 season. You knew you had something special in the works. Well, we had something special, as I mentioned earlier, when we're talking about this class. Uh, we started 21 seniors. Claude Donati was the only uh, the only uh, non-senior starter, and uh, we lost a DB right before the state finals. And John Hedrick got his first start in the in, as a junior in the state finals. So that was a pretty tough place for him. But it was uh, I know. Uh, the, the season started out very uh, interesting. We uh, we jumped out. It was extremely hot during two days. We we uh, we jumped out to a big lead on LaSalle, and uh, they came to me at half. The official said we want to play a running clock. It's so hot, and you, uh, we said okay. Well, LaSalle scored three times in the second half, and they want <laughs> they wanted to go back to a regular clock. <laughs> Five minutes to go, but and uh, but and uh, we got our quarterback hurt, and uh, Quigley was hurt, and uh, but we ended up and uh, won that game, and it was actually kind of a, a perfect situation. I mean, we really let down in the second half, and uh, it just gave the coaches a lot to get concerned with, and we had to start. Uh, Quigley missed the next game, but we won that again anyway. We got Michigan City, Elston, and then uh, the the key game. Uh, this was the cluster system, and it, and it came down to us and Elkhart Central. The winner of that game was going to go to the playoffs. The loser is going to stay home. And uh, it was uh, it was tied 14-14 at the end of regulation, and. Uh, we scored and missed the extra point. We had a, a very good kicker, and this, I think it's the first one he missed all year. And they had David Schnell, a quarterback, and uh, uh, about you. Uh, they had uh, some, some great speed. Treyus Washington, I mean, that guy's won the 100 in, uh, in the state track meet. And uh, I tell you, I, I could hardly, I could hardly watch because it's, uh, it was Schnell was really good, and, and watching him bomb the end zone four straight times. I, oh, the last play, I turned around, and we had a female trainer named Becky Cop. She says, "Open your eyes, coach. We just won it." <laughs> I didn't even know. I turned away to watch the last play, but, uh, but. Uh, so uh, that was a big, big win, and uh, as we mentioned yesterday, or last week, excuse me, well, you, you can screen that out any way you want to, uh, the reason that the computer system left was St. Joe having had three straight undefeated seasons and not getting into the playoffs. The reason we lost the cluster is uh, I and Truthfully said that that the second best the best team we played all year was Elkhart Central without a doubt. Well, then they sued to get rid of the cluster system. Said why, if we're the second best team in the state, why do we not get to get in the tournament? So this is why we end up having the system we have today. IHSA was getting tired of lawsuits, <laughs> and now everybody's in it, and. Uh, the next step they got to make, they've got to do, they've got to seed at least the top two teams in each sectional. You got to make the regular season count for something, as far as a home field or something, you know. But I don't know. But anyway, that was uh, once we uh, once we won that game, we we were able to rest some starters. We uh, uh, had to set out a couple of our running backs and. Uh, Anyway, we got we were getting healthy for the for the uh, tournament, and we were we were we were ready 
you go when it started. Six, seven, seven first team all league performers in the Northern Indiana Conference for Penn. Dave Jerzak at tackle, Steve Penn for a guard, Mark uh, Plenser at the center, Kevin Witkowski, your, your running back. That's just on offense. On defense, Tommy Dilley, it was an end. Uh, Patty Barrier at uh, linebacker, and then Todd Yeoman, defensive back. So, and I didn't even talk about the second team. This team was loaded. Yeah, it was uh, it was a good group. I'll tell you. <laughs> a great story about uh, David Jerzak down to Warsaw game. We played Warsaw for the first uh, first time we played them, and I remember two things. Uh, we had. Uh, uh, a, a, a defensive tackle was our kickoff man, and we also made him one of our headhunters going downfield. He his name was Rich Watring, and uh, he kicked off and went through the wall and hit hit the returner so hard. I, I remember seeing their team doctor sprinting out in the field before the whistle even blew. So I knew that was a good hit. But the other one, Dave Jerzak. Uh, was I watched him? He was during the week. His his shoe just flat. His sole was off the shoes, just flapping. So we got him a new pair of shoes, same style, same size, everything. So he puts them, gets them Friday, and all excited. He's limping on the field, and uh, he's limping back to the huddle. He's not himself. You know I. I don't understand it. We end up punting, and he comes off, and he said, Coach, I know this is also a cluster game. He said, I know we got to have it. And he says, I'm going to play as hard as I can, as long as I can. But he said, I don't know much longer I can I can go. He said, my feet are killing me. I didn't know what. I said, go down and look at Doc Portley's. Tell him. So he, he goes down there to Doc Portley's, and Doc says, take off your shoe. And uh, he takes it off. Doc reaches in the toe, pulls out three big pieces of paper. They said, he said, you're supposed to take this out, Dave, before you put it on. He did it for his other shoe. And I watched him go out, and, I, and, and he's out now he's just his old self, driving people downfield, fired up, running back to the hell. <laughs> Called Doc the Miracle Worker after that one. <laughs> <laughs> Second team performers were Scott Kaiser, Bob Montel, uh, Rick DeMauro, Claude Donati, uh, Doug Dillman. Uh, let's talk about those guys. Those are big players. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, Mark Plaster won the SQ. We're the 165-pound center, and uh, Doug Dillman was the middle guard. He was like 155. And, I mean, people just... You know, you don't play like people like that anymore. But you know, I've never, uh, never put a, a stopwatch on a winner, man. If you're a winner, you can find a place to play, and the kids that love the game are going to find a way to succeed. We had, we had some small players playing for us that year, and uh, they did, uh, they did very, very good. <coughs> Scott Kaiser was uh, jumped off sides four times the state championship game. And it's hard to jump off sides of Penn when your cadence is down 88 and go and you always snap it on go. It's kind of hard. And i never forget at commencement, the, valed valedict the valedictory address, the valedictorian has to speak, he's up there. And he says, I know a lot of my football teammates are wondering what I'm doing up here after the state championship game, jumping off sides four times, he said. but. Thankfully, you know, I had I was doing okay at my classwork, <laughs> but uh, that was kind of that was kind of funny. All right, we got to keep things fair now. November 11th, the Brickies come back here yeah. to uh, to Penn for their one and only trip. Uh, defeat the Bricks 17 to nothing. Once again, a reunion with Don Howe. Let's talk about the approach. Um, looking at the 1983 Hobart team, and and talk about the 1983 uh, game against the Brickies. Well, we had, uh, first of all, Ed Kent Piotrowski played the say He came in and talked to our team before the game and, uh, you know, told them how, you know, how much 
Mm -hmm. What they took away from us in 79, we can do the same thing to them in 83. And uh, I'll never forget, the wind, we came out, the wind was ferocious. The flag was about ready to rip off the flagpole. And uh, for the first time in my life, it only happened twice. This is the first one. I was saying, if we won the flip, we were going to take the wind. Because uh, because if, if they kicked off to us in the, with the wind and we didn't get a first down, the whole first quarter played be played inside our, our side of the 50. So uh, Art Klinger is my uh, resident weather expert. He's, and he's been right on rain, he's been right on wind. He came up to me and said, don't take the ball. He says this wind will die down at 8 o'clock. Okay. So we won the foot, took the ball, and we go out, and the wind, if anything, is picked up, and the arc's hiding from me. <laughs> and uh, I never got Wachowski's back to receive the kick. They kicked it. He was on the five yard, and never moved. He just watched it. Then it, just, it, was, it hit out of the end zone. I mean, he never, he never even moved. He just knew it was gone. <laughs> And I got the offense together, and I said, what I said is true. If we don't get a first down, uh, if we, the whole first quarter's going to be played inside our 50, and uh, we're going to put an unbelievable pressure on our defense. So uh, first down, nothing. Second down, through to Rich Peterson, sure-handed tight end, but he dropped the ball. Now it's third and 10. And uh, we ran what we call fake in flood and uh, hit Wachowski out in the flat, broke a tackle, ran about 15 yards. And that, boy, that set the tone for the whole game. We went down and scored, had a seven to nothing lead. And uh, the second, second quarter, then they had the wind in their face. And uh, we ended up making it a two score game and knew right then that now, we were in command, and when we made it three score, 17 0, it was, uh, you know, revenge was complete over the Brickies. Give us an idea on where you guys were at emotionally, knowing you were one game away, one win away from winning the state championship after the win against Hobart here at home. Well, it's what, ha what you never know. I mean, if you've never won it before, you don't know how good you have to be. Oh, we knew we were good. We knew we had a shot, but you know how how good a shot do we have? Do we, I mean? Uh, I believe we played Anderson Highland after the Brickies. Or before no, the, that was before, before the yeah. Brickies. Oh, I got. <laughs> there's an interesting story in that one, Paul. I better just you know. Nope. We played Anderson Highland, and the one thing I will say to do that you have to do. You have to make plans to trade films for the next week before you even won your game. And I mean, I, it always makes you nervous doing that. Well, my college uh, fraternity brother, Jim Belden, was the coach at Carmel, and they were playing Anderson Highland. So I called Jim, I said, you know, I hate to do this, Jim, but I mean, you know, we gotta make, we gotta make plans. He said, yeah, I know. He says, I'm gonna tell you something. He said, don't even scout Anderson Highland. He said, if we lose to them, I'm killing myself. He says, we'll kill them. And uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna host you guys next week. And I said, Are you, okay. So I told our scouts, because you know, Anderson Highland wasn't necessarily a big football name, you know, and Carmel was. So I told our uh, scouts, just, just scout Carmel. Don't even scout. Anderson Highland. They said, okay. When Anderson Highland went up by 30 points in the fourth quarter, they figured they'd better start, they better start looking at them a little bit. And all they had was their prevent defense. And they came back the next morning and got dead about nothing. I said, oh man, it's my fault, my fault, and everything. And uh, I said, God, I mean, I, don't, I mean, preparation's our game. I don't know. I gotta think this over, so I go home and my phone rings. Yes, it's Anderson Highland coach. He said, Coach Geisman, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, 
but we didn't think we had a chance to win, so we didn't send any scouts up to Penn. We don't know anything about you. Uh, it's my fault. If I, I know you had scouts here. He said, if I drive the films up to your house, will you trade films with me? I said, oh, let me talk to my coaches. <laughs> yeah, we will. I, I believe in doing that, you know, from the spirit of fair play. He said, I, how many do you want to try? I said, last three. So I'll be right up with him. I said, he said, I'll be there in about four hours. I said, that would be great. Thank you. So he drove all the way up. Never know. We didn't have anything on him either. And, uh, he, but he knew we had scouts there. He just figured we had everything. So that was it. And then there was even something a little better. I don't know if I, we had uh, Mark Quigley pull his hamstring that week. And back then they didn't have those compression pants. So I told his, him and his mom, I said, go out and buy Mark a woman's panty girdle and let him wear that. That's the same as compression pants turned out being years later. So he went out and uh, he got him a, a girdle. He said, this helps, and it helps a lot. It went down to like his knees. And, so he played in it, and uh, sports writer, and he had a good game down there, and the sports writer from Anderson Highland uh, asked if he could speak with uh, Mark after the game. I said, sure, I'll let, you know, make her kids available. So he goes back to the locker room. There's Mark standing there in a pink panty girdle with little black bows on it. The guy says, oh, Oh, he said, listen, I'm liberal myself. I'm not going to say anything about this in the paper. And I had to explain to him why he was wearing it. And, uh, but a uh, couple of interesting sides. It was, uh, it was uh, cold as heck. And, uh, and we stopped. We had uh, box lunches with us. And we stopped and handed them out in uh, Kokomo in the uh, in a parking lot of the mall there. And the kids were going to eat them on the way down from Kokomo to Anderson. We were out there, and a car comes by, and uh, somebody yells, Penn sucks. They said, This is just like being a Mishawaka. <laughs> so, I mean, that's uh, some interesting things in going down there to, uh, to Anderson High. All right, let's talk about the state championship game against uh, Bobby Springer's. Uh, Indianapolis Washington team you guys were able to uh, beat them 25-14 to win the school's first uh, state championship uh, let's just talk about it. I know it was a great crowd 8,000 people there at North Central High School uh, what do you reflect back on that first state championship game well the, the first thing was uh, the the IHSA saw all, all the pen money coming in boy that we had they had to send more tickets up twice so uh, we were supposed to be the visitors. They made the change that Penn would be the home team. We really upset Bobby Springer because we were going to fill the stands and there wouldn't be enough room on the visitor side. So, uh, so that was the first thing I was a little upset, you know, a little nervous about because, uh, you know, they were upset because it was supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, their home game and we got the, we got the nice side of the stands. It was very, very, uh, really unseasonably warm. It was like 70 degrees. And it was the Saturday at that time, the Saturday before Thanksgiving. And we got down there and the guy, he put the uh, IU Purdue and, and the Notre Dame uh, Air Force games on the on the uh, PA. PA. So our kids are out in the field laying there and uh, and our fans are already lined up and they're calling our kids over and giving them blankets to go up and you know, save their spots for them and everything. So uh, I remember, uh, <laughs> I remember that uh, I had to, uh, I got to study this gently. I had to go to the John right, right at halftime. We're going in, but something happened right before half. We were behind. I was talking and I, I forgot to go. We go back out. And uh, we get the opening, the kickoff third quarter, and I called quickly, uh, give me three straight end plays. 
and I go head back to the locker room, and everybody did not, everybody was making a huge deal on that. Where's Coach Keesman? Where is he? Like that? Quigley's calling his own plays. We were in three sweeps, and picked up first down, and I came back out and started talking to our wide outside and called the game again. But that was something, I mean, I was asked about three or four times after the game. It was a little embarrassing to talk about, but uh, it happened. <laughs> All right. I got a copy of the Indianapolis Star. Mm -hmm. Look at that. What do you think about that? What does that make you feel like when you see that? Yeah. Pretty good stuff, right? Yeah, pretty neat. The classic is outsized Washington Falls. I'll just tell you how small some of our guys were too. But we did have uh, we did have two big time. Bobby Montel got a full to uh, Northern Illinois and uh, Jerzak was around 260. So uh, that was, uh, we, had, we had some nice size guys. Who excelled in this group and who was the overachievers? Well, I'll tell you what, I, that's an interesting thing that uh, I would probably uh, talk about later, but I do not use the term overachiever anymore. I don't, I don't think that's fair to be called an overachiever. If you achieve, you're an achiever. So we didn't have any overachievers. They achieved, they were achievers. They all, they all could play. Looking at the, the state championship numbers, you outrushed them 263 to 123. You only had 34 yards passing, but we're four of nine in that regard, but uh, didn't, turn, didn't turn the ball over uh, via the fumble. Uh, but your thoughts from, I mean, you only gave up uh, a total of 163 yards. The defense did its job. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, you know, they, that was the team that during the regular season gave up 140, years, uh, 140 yards rushing. But we gave up more than that in the uh, playoffs. I'll never forget Carol Osborne, one of the linebackers. They were running a sprint draw. And they were, uh, I think this is Fort Wayne and Northrop. They were going down the field about six, eight yards. I said, I called time out, I said to him, I said, are they that good? He said, on that play, they're that good, Coach. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and the, the, the thing that uh, iced the game was a pass, though. It was a fade from uh, Mark Quigley to Mark Dietrich. And that, that uh, it was up at that time, it was 18 to 14. There was uh, down the final few minutes. And uh, we threw a fake. I mean, that Quigley and and uh, uh, Dietrich had been throwing that all all summer that together. And they said, and Quig says, let's it's there. So, uh, boy, you know, we were running, wanted to run the clock and everything. But I said, okay, we threw it. And Mark did a little inside fake and took off, and the DB fell down. He is wide open, just right there, and that made it. 24-14, and that, I mean, that was the game right there. We knew we had, we knew we were going to be state champ. Didn't know it till right almost at the end, even though we were pretty much in control. But they'd had, I mean, they'd run the ball well all year and done some things, uh, so we were, it, it wasn't a sure thing, yeah. How about those Penn fans? 90 minutes before kickoff, the entire section of the field was jammed. Of course, the 60, the high 60 degree weather was certainly a factor, but uh, how about those fans? Oh, unbelievable. As I said, they were, we were there and they were lined up and calling, asking our kids to go up and uh, take blankets down, save their seats for them and everything. Yeah, they were lined up all the way around the stadium waiting to get in before the gates even opened. I knew we were going to have a great crowd. When they named us the home team, I knew that uh, we'd, we'd sold quite a few tickets. What, as you look back on one defining moment that made the, your first state championship, uh, made them a state championship caliber team, was there a defining moment for this group? Well, I mean, it's obvious the Elkhart Central win. Uh, we knew up until that time we didn't know if we were going to be in the playoffs. After that, we knew we were going to be in the playoffs for sure. So I'd say that. That had to be it, and that was the beginning and the end of the cluster system because of it. But uh, it was, uh, you know, our uh, 
our motto is in the off season. The kids say, "How are we going to be, coach? How do you think?" Go say. We say we we work so hard and our plan is so sound. We not only expect success, we deserve it. And uh, that's that's what we said. You know, we ex we expect it and we deserve it. So it wasn't like uh, we we sold ourselves as underdogs coming down there or anything. We thought we deserved this. Your first state championship group of coaches that won the rings: Dave Geyer, Donnie Monhu. Bill Stricker, Art Klinger, Chuck Wagner, Wally Um. Hey, there's a whole bunch of Hall of Famers in that group. Yeah, there is. Oh, my. Yeah, All is. right, let's just talk about that group and uh, how awesome was it to be able to, and a lot of these guys started with you. Uh, what is this? Uh, what was this group all about, this coaching staff? Well, the thing we used to say, if you can't enjoy coaching a pen, you can't enjoy coaching anywhere because uh, like the defense, the old line, they picked their own starters. They had freedom to substitute during the game without even talking to me, you know. And uh, it was just, our coaches had as much authority and as much responsibility as any coaching staff in the state. And they had as much as any head coaches. Uh, as I said, the first few years I was here, I have to spend uh, a morning and an afternoon talking with the defensive staff, giving them my th theory of defense and the way I wanted things taught, so on and so forth. Because once we divided up, they were by themselves. Well, after about three years, I never had to have that meeting again. I mean, they understood, they were on board, they knew what was going on, and they made their own game plans. And for the next 10 years, they would give me like a copy of the game plan. This is it. After that, I didn't even have to see that. I didn't left the lecture, but I didn't have to. I just had that much confidence in them. And, uh, and when you have that kind of, you know, responsibility, I mean, they, they were like the equivalent of uh, gym rats in basketball. I mean, they like to go to the clinics, like to sit around and talk about football. I mean, it wasn't only their job, it was their hobby and it was fun. And uh, it, they were, they all had, they all had their, uh, their areas of uh, authority and responsibility. So I, I think, you know, I never called them uh, assistant coaches. I was calling them associate co coaches because that's the way that's the way it was. I mean, they, I just trusted them with a lot, with a lot of responsibility, and they responded. So, I mean, it, it was a great group, and they are all the ones who are in the Hall of Fame, very deserving. Okay, we're going to switch gears, and we're going to talk about the coaches as we're going to wrap up 1983. So now I want to go back and I just want to talk about these coaches. So let's okay. talk about each and let's start with uh, let's start with Donnie Mon, who another guy who's uh, who comes as about as well regarded as any coach that I've ever uh, met. So let's talk about what Donnie Mon, who meant to the Penn football program. What did what was his role? How did it evolve into where he was at? How long did uh, did you feel comfortable having Donnie on the staff before you were able to give him full reign of the things that he was doing? Well, actually, uh, we didn't have a position defensive coordinator, but if we did, it'd have to be, it'd have to be three. Don Monhut, Wally Yeoman, and then, not that year, but then Corey Yeoman. Those would, uh, those would be the three, and they basically, they watched their own film. They, they would come in like at five o'clock Saturday morning, and they would have stuff all broken down by the time I'd get in about nine, you know. And uh, it was, uh, Donnie was just real smart. He was a raisin counter. He liked everything to be the way it was supposed to be. And he, he knew what it was supposed to look like. Some people don't. He knew what it was supposed to look like. And uh, he just, uh, I mean, he is just very, very smart. And I mean, he put the time in, it was just, it was, it was just, you know, it was just a natural evolvement. Okay, Art Klinger. Art, uh, first of all, he had the social highlight of the year with the highlight film, to which uh, all the coaches came and uh, that, was the, that was the social highlight for if you were a pen coach was Art's highlight party in February. That's the first thing. But Art was, uh, Art was great. He, uh, he was very uh, authoritative when he talked to kids. He had a great teacher. 
He was great in the classroom. He was great on the football field. And uh, he just, uh, you know, the kids, uh, he used to, we had, the one thing I found out when I coached the All-Stars in 1984, the first time, everything was good until it got to be pregame. Every coach on the staff wanted to give the pregame talk. I was given it, and I would uh, pause, take a breath, Leroy would start in, and then it would go on. Everybody wanted to talk, so uh, I decided after that, that on, on Thursdays, after press, we have our own pep rally. We have ever since. And uh, each coach got to speak for about a minute or two, depending. And it was really neat because sometimes they'd speak to their own group in front of the whole team. Sometimes a defensive coach would talk to the offense, say, hey, you know, we need some help from you guys this week. Sometimes they'd talk to, they'd tell a story that was just related to something. And, uh, and Art's big, Torah, 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 attack, attack, attack. That was one of, a, that was one of Art's big talk. And I, I laugh at Matt and his buddies, they, when they still get home like Christmas, and they'll go down and put their highlight film on and watch it. And then they'll, they'll talk about the Thursday night talks. And that, that's one of the big arts. Torah, Torah, Torah. <laughs> he said he gave that every year. And uh, I mean, it's just, and you know, just art, it was just, uh, you know, he, he coached the line inside non-backers and uh, did a great job. All right, next coach we want to talk about is the legendary Chuck Wagner. Mm -hmm. Wags, uh, I've heard coaches say he's one of the best technician coaches uh, in the history of the game. So let's just talk about Wags. Well, you're right. He is absolutely, uh, he could, uh, you could give, the opponents could be doing something that we had not even prepared for. And I said, Coach Wagner, what are we going to do? He said, well, we could do he here, here, and pull around, or we could do this, this, and let the backside guard lead through, or, I mean, he, <laughs> you never stumped him. He would, you would do something, and he would know exactly what we should do. It, uh, the only thing that, the only flaw I would ever say he had is he wanted to do too much. We go on Sunday, he wanted to have seven different ways to block the end play. I said, we can't teach seven different, oh, we got to. No, I said, you're going to base weight and you'll have one. He said, I don't know what one I'll need. I said, well, study the film and come up with it. And I'll never forget, one, one time he asked me, he said, when practice is over, I'm going to take the line and let take the shoulder pads off. Or we're just going to, I just want to show them this in case we need it. You're not giving me any time to practice it, so I just want to show it to them in case I need it. All seven ways. Okay. So uh, we come in the office, and Corey and I were having a Coke back in my office, and uh, we come out, and it was dark. And I said, here, I'll drive you down to your car. So he got in, and Corey said, stop. There's ghosts on our field. I looked, the offensive line was still out there, it's pitch black. And I, I said, Coach Wagner, let those guys come in now. So they came in, they were coming by me, muttering under their breath. <laughs> they were so upset. I mean, they were an hour after practice, it was pitch black. Wagner had them still walking through things. But uh, I mean, that's the way he was. And, uh, but he, uh, you had to put your finger on him a little bit, but I mean, as far as offensive line play, he knew more than I ever knew. And uh, like I say, I, I deferred to him on everything except the number of adjustments. <laughs> what did I do, turn that off? <laughs>